As I have worked through documentation to build this presentation, I've learned that whenever there is a, ne as a necessary commodity, such as air, water, food, soil, shelter, jobs, energy, or your internet connection, there will be unscrupulous opportunists who will use the tools of government and regulation to insert themselves into the process for the purpose of, of making money, both from the taxpayers in general as well as from private individuals. It's true for water which falls in plentiful amounts from our western Washington skies, for our farmers, for every industry or job in which I've ever worked. Like modern fishing and identity thieves, the methods scammers use are myriad, prolific, and amazing. I know those aren't encouraging words, but this is the broader picture problem. Sunshine on government is our task because our news media are busy selling advertisements than they are gathering news. What's the problem? Here is a quote from the Center for Environmental Law and Policy dated January 17, 2018 two days before ESSB 6091 was signed into law that clearly states that wells are the main culprit in declining st in stream flows. Declining in stream flows are considered to be one of the contributors to the declining fish populations. Yet no one disputes that wells represent less than 1% of all water used. That was a number given to the Whatcom County Council in 2016 by the Department of Ecology. Here and after, I'm going to call the Department of Ecology simply Ecology. Indeed, it can be shown that well owners likely carry away from the point of withdrawal quite a lot less than 1% of the water that flows in our streams. There are good reasons to question all of the conclusions given for declining fish populations, and each of those conclusions is going to require a separate presentation. This is not to say that well owners can't be part of the solution to our declining fish populations, but that responsibility truly lies not just with well owners, but all of us. Decreasing fish populations. Some groups want to, lay, want to blame well owners for decreasing water quantity. Some want to lay it at the feet of farmers for washing animal effluent and farm chemicals into the streams, decreasing water quality. The path to the current situation has layers and layers of bureaucracy. I will try to untangle the part that applies to well owners by looking at the road that led to the Hearst and Foster decisions. I will also look at what appears to be the legislative fix for Hearst, ESSB 6091, the Whatcom County Council's Ordinance of January 24, 2018, and the implications for well owners. The Department of Ecology posted their interpretation of 6091, so I'll look at that, and finally, I will look at why well owners need to continue to be involved in the various discussions about water quantity and quality in Whatcom County. First, a little history. The Water Resources Act of 1971 names a long list of uses for water, including agricultural, industrial, wildlife, scenic beauty, and potable water for domestic needs. These are all beneficial uses that must be addressed. Development of both public and private water supply systems is to be encouraged. Locally, the Nooksack, the Nooksack Rule set minimum in-stream flows judged necessary for environmental needs and human uses. Environmental needs include the water fish need to spawn, rear, and migrate to and from the Pacific. Human uses include agriculture, industry, and home. In 1985, groundwater was presumed to not be in continuity with surface water. Even so, Ecology's Nooksack Rule closed many drainage basins with the, within the county to further groundwater withdrawals, except for wells drawing 5,000 gallons per day or less for limited purposes, as set forth in RCW 90.44.050, which is called the Exempt Well Statute. This section of the Water Code exempts those wishing to drill and use such wells from, water, from the water right permit application process. This code does not exempt such wells from any, from any other aspect of the Water Rights Code. Again, when the Nooksack Rule was written, we were only considering surface water use. 
The new ambiguity in water continuity con complicated agricultural interests in both ground and surface water use. Agriculture became unable to secure additional water rights to run farms. What exactly is a water right? A water right is a legal right. That means it's been adjudicated. It's been granted by a court. It's a legal right to withdraw a quantified amount of water from a certain place within a given amount of time, such as daily. Water rights in much of western Washington have never been quantified or adjudicated. You may have heard about the 40-some years long adjudication process for parts of eastern Washington like the Yakima Basin. It was recently completed and water rights were quantified and adjudicated. Some of eastern Washington has reservoirs with total amounts of water that are not too difficult to measure. In western Washington, we work from rainfall and snowpack. It is far more difficult to accurately calculate the total amount of water available here. Studies have been underway in our county for decades. The total water quantity is still a best guess. Washington follows the doctrine of prior appropriation concerning water rights. This means that the oldest use of a surface or groundwater withdrawal is called a senior water right. It doesn't matter where in the stream flow this water was withdrawn. If a farm, industry, or city near the mouth of a river was the first user of water from a river and is using X gallons of water on a regular basis, then later users upstream that begin to withdraw water must ensure that the user near the mouth of the river will always be able to draw those X gallons of water. If upstream use doesn't disturb those X gallons of water, then a junior water right may be awarded. Additional withdrawals may be permitted until someone doesn't get the water to which they have a right. Does groundwater withdrawal from aquifers below the level of a stream affect stream flow? In some cases, yes. In our cool, wet western Washington, this is much less true for domestic wells and much harder to show. How does one acquire a new water right? Well, you apply to Ecology for a permit and you get a permit to develop a water right. When the water is put to full use, then a certificate of water right is issued. Water rights typically follow land ownership, but someone who buys land with a water right and decides to not continue to use that right could sell some or all of that right to another landowner on the stream. Water rights not used over time can also be lost, although this typically requires a court action. Ecology's in-stream flow rule set minimum in-stream flows for various basins and sub-basins throughout the year. An in-stream flow rule is like a water right for the stream itself and is a best guess at the amount of water needed to keep fish in our streams. The numbers can be found under the Washington Advisory Code shown here. When these flows were established, there were some water rights already in place, and in-stream flow rules cannot supersede these water rights. However, in-stream flows, or lack of them, can supersede junior water rights, especially in times of drought. Users with junior water rights all along a stream may be required to curtail their use to ensure in-stream flows. In the early 1990s, the cities of Bellingham and Linden, along with Whatcom County and the Public Utility District 1, formed the Nooksack Basin Water Users Steering Committee. What's a public utility district and why is it in this discussion? Most of the public utility districts, or PUDs, were formed nearly a century ago when lines from the newly constructed Grand Coulee Dam were strung all over the state. The Bonneville Power Administration markets the power from the dams such as Cooley and gives the PUDs first right to low-cost power from those facilities. PUDs can be formed by vote, and this happened most often when existing utility companies found it uneconomical to provide utilities to smaller or more remote customers, especially farmers. 
The PUDs say they are consumer-owned and non-profit, but in function they are a type of government formed by vote to provide power and water. More recently, in some less populated counties of Washington, they have been formed to provide tele telecommunications. PUD-1 of Whatcom County was formed in 1937 to supplant Puget Power, now Puget Sound Energy. For a variety of reasons that include World War II, that didn't happen. But when industries came to Cherry Point, PUD-1 had a customer. Now, PUD-1 purchases power from the BPA for the Cherry Point, for the Cherry Point Industries. It began providing water in the, in the 1960s, first to the new aluminum refinery at Cherry Point. It claims to hold water rights to draw 53 million gallons per day from the Nooksack River at two locations near Ferndale for those industries and for some 50 seasonal irrigation customers. It draws groundwater for an industrial park north of Ferndale. Even though it has the right to withdraw 53 million gallons per day, the average withdrawal is 14 million gallons per day. For comparison purposes, the city of Bellingham, with half the population of Whatcom County, averages 10 million gallons per day. Remember, the PUD exists by the vote of the population. Under a Washington law that allows citizens to form a way to provide utilities for themselves as a government agency. The PUD must live between what it costs to buy its utilities from agencies such as the BPA and what revenue they get to sell those utilities to customers. PUD commissioners who are voted into office by the population and are paid decide how to run the PUD. When PUD 1 of Whatcom County was formed, its founding documents gave it the right to offer utility services to anyone in Whatcom County. There are three commissioners for PUD 1 and they represent the entire county even though the PUD serves only areas west of Ferndale. Given access to right-of-ways by the county, the PUD could become your water, power, and telecommunications company even if you already own a well. This could indeed happen through a vote of the population. Of course, the population could also vote to disband the PUD. When the PUD does its job well, we're all pretty happy. Should its commissioners develop a taste for profits, construction, and government overreach, then that could be a source of increased cost of living, restrictions on rural and city life, and unhappy voters. Back to Washington water law. As populations grew along with industries and farms, the question of water rights got increasingly complicated. Eastern Washington water uses and water demands are very different from Western Washington. In 1988, the adjudication of water rights in some places was underway, but other Washington counties showed little interest in doing that. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. Therefore, in 1988, the Watershed Planning Act was passed to, quote, provide local citizens with the maximum possible input concerning their goals and objectives for water resource management and development, end quote. These watershed basins, or groups of related basins, are called Water Resource Inventory Areas. The acronym WRIA is most often pronounced WIRA. WIRAs were numbered beginning in the upper left-hand corner of the state and follow river basins rather than county lines. WIRA 1 is the Nooksack Basin, which includes much of the western third of Whatcom County and part of Skagit County. It clearly delegated planning to local citizens, quote, the local development of these plans serves vital local interests by placing it in the hands of people who have the greatest knowledge of both the resources and the aspirations of those who live and work in the watershed and who have the greatest stake in the proper long-term management of the resources." End quote. This is a picture of the planning process that the Act outlines. The group that does the planning for the watershed is called the planning unit. It consists of initiating governments and local citizens who live and work in the watershed. The governments that initiate planning can be the county or counties that occupy the watershed, the largest city in the watershed, the PUD with the largest water right, or the tribes within the watershed. One of these, likely the one with the most technical and financial resources, 
can be designated as the lead agency. Together with citizens who represent a wider variety of water users, a plan is developed for the watershed. Technical assistance may be obtained from the state or lead agency staff. Ecology must approve the plan. There will be hearings on the plan and revisions suggested. These suggestions go back to the planning unit, which may revise the plan. Under RCW 90.82.060, the governments listed here may initiate planning. Planning unit seats are to go to a wide range of water resource interests. In addition to the local governments, these could include forestries, fisheries, agriculture, environmental advocates, land developers, water associations, and private well owners. The planning unit has five tasks, including how to assess the status of water resources of the WIRA and determine how, to man how best to manage the water resources of the WIRA or multi-WIRA area, to balance the competing resource demands for that area within parameters defined by the Act. Five tax tasks include water quantity, in-stream flow rules, water quality, habitat, and the identification of projects and activities that can enhance the environment. This is a major piece that complicates the role of our local planning unit. While their water right has not been quantified or adjudicated, the tribes claim they have the oldest water right in the Nooksack Basin. When the tribes chose to not participate in the planning unit, a joint board was formed which included tribes, the PUD, Bellingham, and Whatcom County governments. These are the initiating governments under the Watershed Planning Act. For the purpose of administering the project's financial operations and to provide the tribes a means of government-to-government -government interaction that bypassed the planning unit. After the Watershed Management Plan Phase 1 was adopted in 2005, the members of the Joint Board, together with state agencies and other parties, began a series of confidential meetings to negotiate in-stream flow levels according to a key element of the management plan called the In-Stream Flow Action Plan. The talks dragged on for years when some planning unit members questioned whether it was time to revisit the In-Stream Flow Action Plan, the Joint Board staff stopped scheduling planning unit meetings. Planning unit meetings ceased from mid-2009 through August 2013. The Joint Board joined with the Salmon Recovery Board to become the Consolidated Board and continued discussions without the planning unit and behind closed doors. A product of their planning is the Lower Nooksack Strategy. Without the planning unit being active, the Consolidated Board presented itself to the Puget Sound Partnership as the planning entity for WIRA 1. It was named the Local Implementing Agency by the Puget Sound Partnership and received funds from the EPA, other federal and state programs, to respond to the PSP's action agenda. What's the Puget Sound Partnership? It is a program of the government of Washington State with the stated purpose to correct the damage caused by humans living on Puget Sound for the last 150 years. You can find reports about the Lower Nooksack strategy, what it is, and if it was accomplished. The failed objectives were probably the most important parts of the strategy and are among the reasons we have the current situation. In 2011, the tribes in Whatcom County asked the Department of Interior to define their water rights. I guess that why they made that request could be that they felt they could get a better deal from the Department of Interior or perhaps a faster decision. The tribe's request has not been acted on and may not be. When the planning unit reconvened in 2013, its work plan included a review of ecology's in-stream flow rule and an inquiry into the status of plan implementation. Were agencies doing the work that the plan called for? Those two important objectives are still eluding us. 
So, October 2016, the Hearst decision. The Hearst case was brought by self-proclaimed environmentalists and attorneys. Remember those unscrupulous opportunists mentioned at the beginning of this presentation? FutureWise and Resources have funds to litigate and win judgments. If they were truly trying to protect the environment, wouldn't they use their funds and the resources of Huxley College of Environmental Studies at Western Washington University to discover the best practices and ideas for improving the environment of Whatcom County? <sighs> the legal decision was based on the Growth Management Act's directive to protect water resources. The decision doesn't set aside the old Nooksack rule, but calls it outdated with a newer understanding of the continuity of groundwater with surface water. Before the Hearst decision, most counties relied on ecology's assessment of water availability, and it was ecology that granted well permits based on that availability. However, the not one molecule rule means that new users of water must show their use does not impair in-stream flow by even one molecule of water. Hmm. At any rate, water planning is no longer in the hands of local government or citizens. Whatcom County responded by replacing a moratorium on new wells. Without a water source, new building permits cannot be issued. Whatcom County property owners seeking to develop with private wells had to provide, to the satisfaction of county staff and at their own expense, a hydrogeological report showing that their well could not impair the Nooksack rule or other senior water rights. Alternatively, they could have been compelled to fund mitigation measures sufficient to alleviate impairment, whatever that might be. But with the standard of not one molecule and how to measure that, this all becomes nearly impossible. The decision in Foster versus Ecology is often referred to in connection with the Hearst decision. The city of Yelm worked with Ecology to produce a plan that would have provided water for future growth for the city. Yelm proposed a variety of mitigations and habitat improvements. The Foster decision put the Yelm project on hold. Along comes ESSB 6091. It was written in response to the Hearst decision and became law on January 19, 2018. It requires that counties must update their watershed management plans. The planning unit is once again empowered to engage all stakeholding parties to write the plan. The planning unit includes the initiating governments and citizens who live and work in the watershed. Seats for the local tribes have always been there for them, but are empty. The legislation again places water planning into the hands of local citizens, including the water districts, non-municipal water systems, diking and drainage districts, environmental interests, fishers, forestry, land development, and private well owners. The planning unit's work includes deciding the best actions, recommendations, and projects that will offset or mitigate exempt domestic groundwater withdrawals. If the planning unit and initiating governments fail to do this by February of 2019, then ecology will take up the work of determining bucket-for-bucket -bucket offsets or mitigation for domestic groundwater withdrawals on their own. 6091 also established five pilot projects, watching their various effects on water quality and quantity. Yelm, which was affected by the Foster decision, becomes one of the five pilot projects to watch to test alternative mitigation plans for in-stream flows. Yelm can now move forward with its project. ESSB 6091 says that private wells are for domestic use only and can be limited to 3,000 gallons of withdrawal per day across an annual average. There will be a $500 fee for new wells, of which $350 will go to the Department of Ecology. Well restrictions or limitations, such as withdrawal limits to 3,000 gallons per day, shall be recorded, presumably with the land title. Wells that were legally drilled before January 19, 2018, the date of the legislation, are deemed to show that an adequate water supply exists for the issuing of a building permit. If there is water, then you can apply for a building permit. Metering of a well is not required, but metering in the Dungeness Basin in Kittitas County 
is included in two of the five pilot projects. These projects were partially underway before the legislation was written, and an interesting note about these projects is that while Ecology has stated that it will not pay for meters already required to be installed, they anticipate paying for meters on future wells that, would be, that will become part of this study. The watershed plan that Whatcom County is to develop will not apply to those parts of Whatcom County that are in another watershed. These include Lummi Island, Point Roberts, and the Samish River Basin, which is in Wyra 3. Well, what happened here in Whatcom County? On January 30th and February 13th, the emergency moratorium on wells was simply repealed. So, you want to drill a well in Whatcom County. It's probably a good idea to get started soon. Contact a well driller. File notice of intent to drill with Ecology 72 hours prior to drilling. Drill that well. Your well driller will provide a well log along with water testing. Take your water test to the health department. The health department can require water treatments if such are needed. The health department provides a water available paperwork for a building permit. You take that paperwork and then you pay your $500 fee along with your building permit application. This is not over. On February 13th, Ecology published its interpretation of the new law and may continue to publish other interpretations of the law. I quote, Watershed management plans must identify projects necessary to offset the impact of permit-exempt domestic water use. In time, in-place mitigation is not required to offset this impact. We, that means ecology, and local planning partners must prioritize projects that replace the consumptive impact in the same basin or tributary and during critical times to fish. If this is not feasible, however, we may invest in projects that are in other basins and tributaries and during other times of the year. However, the consumptive impacts from domestic permit-exempt wells must be offset within the WIRA with water for water. While we can invest in out-of-kind projects, those projects are extra and cannot be counted toward offsetting the consumptive impact of domestic permit-exempt withdrawals. In addition, prior to adoption of an updated plan, Ecology must determine that actions in the plan will result in a net ecological benefit to in-stream resources within the WIRA, end quote. In other words, Ecology needs to uh, adhere to the Hearst decision as well. Maybe not one molecule, but at least bucket for bucket. So how much water do those wells use? Do wells that draw from groundwater actually impair in-stream flows? Wells for domestic use take water out of the ground beneath a stream and put most, if not all of it, back through a septic system. Consumption is the part that never gets back into the ground. That could be some evaporation that occurs when watering a lawn or garden. Is the water that domestic well use and don't return constitute all of the water that needs to be replaced? Why is all the focus on the users of less than 1% of the water that flows down the Nooksack, some of whom do not even own properties that drain into the Nooksack? The planning unit is what ESSB 1691 authorized to develop the water plan. Well owners must continue to be involved in that planning. ESSB 1691 authorized $300 million to ecology over 15 years for projects or studies that increase our understanding or restore or enhance stream flows. These projects could impact well owners or well owners on a particular stream basin. Other agencies endowed with funds are also soliciting projects on which to spend money. We don't know what these could be. If you own an undeveloped property and don't have a well, you could still be required to participate. In Ecology's interpretation of ESSB 1691 of February 13th, the tribes do not have to accept a place in the planning unit, and the planning unit may proceed planning without them. The water rights in Whatcom County have not been quantified or adjudicated. 
The argument the tribes have put forth have traditionally been about the amount of water needed to keep in-stream flows high enough to support fish reproduction. But what if tribes choose to use their water for another purpose? There could indeed be a federal court decision that negates or greatly affects the work of the planning unit. There is always the possibility that some or all of ESSB 1691 could be challenged in court and some or all declared unconstitutional. Let's look at this quote again. Are our streams truly imperiled by low stream flows? Do permit exempt wells constitute unregulated water withdrawals? The Growth Management Act pushes populations away from rural areas and into cities, but those new city dwellers still need water. City dwellers also have lawns and gardens. The GMA can't stop population growth. It can only push new populations into cities. However, the GMA and Hearst decisions can be used to make new housing extremely expensive and are also being used to restrict industrial growth and innovation. Does this have the desired effect of protecting streams and farms? A peek at the wooded areas near our cities and along our streams suggests the opposite is happening. The number of homeless there without sanitation or garbage collection is not improving our waters. Homelessness is very bad for the environment. What can you do to help combat those pretender environmentalists? First, join our effort. Please send an email to watkinwellwater at gmail.com. We can keep you updated on meetings and events at which we need to be present with eyes and ears and voices. Second, go to meetings. Third, communicate. We are the local citizens who know our waters best. We are the people who want to make life in Markham County affordable for our children. Consider joining the emailing lists or following the social media pages of such group as Citizens Alliance for Property Rights, The Fourth Corner, Liberty Road, and Common Threats. Encourage your fellow well owners to do the same.